well, praise God for this time. And he's the one that lines all the pieces up and gets everybody in the right spot. And we're going to talk tonight about Revelation. And I didn't really intend to do that. It was just kind of seemed to make sense. Um, and, and that's maybe not the kind of thing just on the fly. You're like, let's just talk about Re Revelation. I don't know. Maybe it's a bad idea. Once again, just, just tell me to stop. You know, just, say, just no, Matt, don't do that. Um, but I, I wanted to start with some thanks because y'all have been really super generous and gracious. Um, all the people who've pitched in, y'all have been generous in your donations. People who've just driven me around, Tim and Tom and Nancy and Richard and Garrett with the sound and Ellen and Penny and, and just so many other people who just work so hard. The elders of the church uh, opened up the facility. I know that's, that's a lot. And people are kind of getting into your stuff, you know, and then things, you can't find the widget or whatever because, you know, this was here and all that kind of stuff happens. But uh, it's just very gr gracious for, for you all to uh, give everything that you're given to make this happen and for you to come out, you know, repeatedly like this to, uh, to support it. And, and hopefully to, to get something from it and to get filled up and encouraged by, by what's being shared. And so um, I'm always really amazed. Like, you kind of experience worship a little bit different when you're going to deliver the message and you kind of know what you're going to say. And then you're experiencing the singing and what's being said. And you just see all the little threads that run through everything. And we didn't talk about it. We didn't really, you know, we didn't sit down and collaborate on that. But... Um, these songs with the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the freedom in Jesus, like um, even little, you know, these, these, these comments that just seem very off the cuff or just so Holy Spirit driven and Holy Spirit led. It's like things that have been said here and there in the morning sessions, you know, that maybe not everybody has heard and just these little threads and it's just like, wow, God, you're just so good at this. Like he sets the order. As much as I want to, you know, send it off to the press and send it in the email and all that, like God sets the order and, and we double space our notes to make sure that there's room for the Holy Spirit to kind of make his way through the, the notes, you know, when we, when we prepare things. And, and so there's something I wanted to share at the end and I'm going to share it at the end, but I want to start with it um, and then also end with it. And it's a, a word from Revelation 22. I'm going to start with the very last chapter and we're going to also end with the very last chapter. Uh, and we, keep, we kept singing about the name of Jesus, right? Did you catch that? I mean, it was like a lot. And that's exactly how this was going to end, was the, on the name of Jesus tonight. That's in my notes. Uh, and so I kind of took what was at the end, and I went on ahead and bumped it up to the beginning, too, because I want you to hear it with continuity with what we just sang. So in Revelation 22, it says... Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. We also sing about the Lamb. And down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and this, his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. There will not be need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord. God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Um, I wanted to end on a blessing tonight. The blessing from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. And I'm going to end on that tonight. That's where I plan. That's kind of, you already know how this is going to end. So, so right before I get there, if you just want to go ahead and walk out, you know, you already know how it's going to end. It's like watching the Titanic movie. You're like, I don't know how this is going to end. Um, but this, the Lord bless you and keep you from Numbers 22 through 26, 22 through 27 was very special to us. When our kids were babies, we would say this over them a lot. And then when my, uh, uh, when my youngest uh, was born, his great-grandmother hadn't got to meet him. And my, my grandmother, my dad's mom, and um, she ended up having leukemia, going through a really hard time, and got pneumonia, and we knew she was kind of on her last days. And so we took, at Thanksgiving, we took our boys to, uh, to go see her. And she met um, her last grandson when he was like, just little. I mean, he was like 10 months old or something. And she got to hold him, and it was really sweet, and got pictures and all that, and in her hospital bed. And then uh, we left, and then she passed away like the day after we left. It was just really sweet. 
It was like she was kind of holding on. You know, we were kind of like, Granny, we're coming. You're going to get to meet him and all this. It was just really sweet. And um, I'll, I'll try to say this without getting too um, sad about it. But she was in the hospital bed, and, and uh, I was speaking the words over her. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you. And then I said, I said, and give you what? And she was kind of really kind of going down, you know. And she said, peace. And I said, yeah, that's right, isn't it? And then the next verse, we, I, I don't know how I missed this. Because I guess it's not in the blessing. Like, all that's like, like formatted a certain way. And you're like, you kind of stop. Because it kind of goes to like a full line, you know. And then the next line says, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. I'm going to put my name on them. Not the name of Pharaoh, not the name of Caesar, not the 666. By the way, we'll get into this, and just, it's just interesting, but you know, 666, he says, goes on your hand or on your forehead. That's Deuteronomy 6, isn't it? Take my law and put it on your, bind it to your hand, bind it to your forehead. He's saying, you got to pick a side. Whose name are you going to have on you? Pick the right side. And so, in Revelation chapter 1, there's really an important verse here. And again, I kind of just read over it for a really long time, but he says, John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from he who, uh, he who is and was and is to come. And from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, firstborn from among the dead, to him who loved us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming on the clouds and every eye will see him. Those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is and who is to come, the Almighty. It starts with Jesus. Just like Hebrews starts with Jesus, just like Romans starts with Jesus, just like, I mean, it just all starts with Jesus. And there's a little verse right before that, I think it's in verse, verse 1, where he, he says something really important for Revelation. He says, I'm going to tell you about the things that are to soon take place. And that reminds us that Revelation has an immediate context, which is in the Roman Empire, in John's day, that he's not just writing just, there are future things in Revelation, new heavens, new earth, and the final judgment, and some of those things haven't, certainly haven't taken place. But what some people do with Revelation is they go, I'm looking for the code, and I'm going to find all the mysteries of what's coming, and then I'm going to look at the newspaper, and then I'm going to look at Revelation, and I'm going to this and that, and the Gog, and the Magog, and the number, and the da-da-da-da-da, and then all these elaborate things, you know, and you, there's televangelists and people who just go all the lab and then you pull in Daniel and all this and, and it can be really fascinating but it's a really a rabbit hole you know and I'm not claiming to like have all have it all figured out this is I mean it's really complicated stuff but there's some really powerful stuff in Revelation that we need to kind of hold on to but I'm of the opinion that most of what he's talking about made sense to them when they heard it and I'm going to try to make sense of a little bit of it, you know, not, not like most of it, but a pretty good chunk of it. So let's walk through some of this here for just, just a bit. So John gets this vision of Jesus, how he's clothed, how he looks, and he's, you know, obviously he's floored by all of this. Every time, the, even an angel comes by and he just drops to the ground. I mean, this is just really the presence of, of these beings and God is just, just powerful. And then we know chapters 2 through 3, the seven churches. And we have like five churches that are doing really, really poorly. And two that he's like, you're doing quite well, you know. And there's two that don't get a lot of flack from Jesus. But the rest are like, you've got this problem, this problem. And you need to repent. You know, you, you, I'm going to take your candlestick away. You know, you need to not be following the false teachings. You need to not be into sexual immorality. And like all the teachings of the Nicolaitans and da-da-da-da. It's like, it's important to obey God. 
Like disobedience does have consequences and his grace is sufficient, but we should be trying to be obedient to him and we don't need to live in rebellion to him and we need to be trying to follow him. Like that's really important. And so, and, and every letter Paul wrote was also to problems. And that, that was one of my funny things with kind of um, church was like, uh, like there is no perfect church, you know? And I'm trying to, like, restore this perfect church, but there's no perfect, like, even the first churches were not perfect churches. They were all trying to figure it out, you know? Uh, and so these churches in Asia, they're hearing this message, these letters from Jesus. And there's seven of them. So it's kind of like saying there's principles in here for everybody, for all churches. I think it's in the sense of all time. We need to pay attention to what he's saying to his churches. And then we get to Revelation chapter 4. And it opens up to this vision of the heavenly throne room, and it's just so powerful. And he says, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice that I heard first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow resembling an emerald, encircled the throne, surrounding the throne were 24, elder, uh, 24 other thrones, and seated on them were the 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles of peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. And in the center around the throne, there were four living creatures, these, these powerful angelic beings, and they were covered with eyes. They have knowledge. They can see that, you know, sight and knowledge are kind of paired up. So they have the, all these eyes covered them in front and in the back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third faced like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings, day and night, never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Reminds us of Isaiah 6. You got the angels with the six wings, and two, they cover their face. They don't want to look on the holiness of God, and two, they're flying. And then in, in Isaiah, it says, two, they covered their feet. And in Hebrew, feet is a word from anywhere from your feet to your waist. So they're kind of covering their nakedness, in a sense, um, in the presence of the holy God. There's reverence. And it says in verse 9, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the, 20, uh, the 24 elders, they fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne. There, any kind of authority they have, anything they have, they're just laying it down before the throne. And it says... From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, the seven lamps were blazing. These were the seven spirits of God. Also, before the throne was what looked like a sea of glass. I think I already read that. In the, in the center was the throne, the four living creatures. Okay, I've already read that. Where am I, where am I trying to get to here? Uh, verse 9, verse 10. Uh, they fall before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns. There it is. And they say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And so you have this picture of the heavenly throne room, and, you know, this is an eternal thing. Like, it feels like this is like an ongoing thing, as if in the presence of God, like, maybe this is still happening. They're there, and there's all this worship happening, and later on we'll find out some more about that. And, and then we get into chapter 5, and there's this another just amazing scene that kind of goes on for several chapters. It goes through, through chapter 6, actually through chapter 8, verse 5. And I just want to read some of this, because I, I, I want maybe you to hear a little bit more of this than, than hear me talk, because uh, this is far more important than anything I've got to say. He says, Then I saw the right hand, verse 5, five verse 1, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides. So that means it's full of mystery. It's full of content both sides of the scroll. It's, and he says, and sealed with seven seals, so nobody can get in. You have to have authority, the right kind of authority to access this information. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, but no one in heaven and on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. And I wept and wept because no one who was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So none of these mysteries are going to get revealed. And he's really upset because he wants to know what it says. Then the elder said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. 
And so then you have this anticipation that like the Aslan's going to walk in the room and just roar and it's like this amazing, tremendous power And because the lion of the tribe of Judah that goes back to the end of Genesis when the blessings come and Judah gets his blessing and, and you know, he's going to be able to open the scroll. And this is that Christ paradox between the mighty, powerful Christ and the suffering servant Christ or the Philippians 2, which was mentioned a while ago, Christ who became a slave and became nothing and emptied himself to receive exaltation. So you're looking for the lion, and then it says, then I saw a lamb, and not just any lamb, but this lamb looked like it had been slain. You get some Passover reference there. You get crucifixion. The lamb, it's like, like a lamb is already very weak, and this is like a dead lamb, but he's alive. I mean, weak, 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 but it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he was standing in the center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent to all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And each one of them had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Here we are. Our prayers are in the heavenly throne room. And they're going up to God. They're being offered up to God. And sometimes we pray and we feel like our prayer doesn't go through the ceiling. You've ever laid there in your bed and just wonder, is it getting through the ceiling, you know? Like, is, is he hearing this thing? And it's like, yes. It's going up to him. It's going up to him day and night. And they sang a new song to the Lamb. Now you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you... Here, here's why, here's why the, Jesus has the authority. But because, that's the why, Right? We say because, we mean this is why. You were slain, and with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of the many angels numbering thousands upon thousands. And in Greek, the number 10,000 was their biggest number. And, it says, and then 10,000 times 10,000. He's like a Google times a Google. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. This is um, no slides tonight on purpose because I want you to imagine this. You close your eyes and think about hearing this. And all these angelic beings with all this power and all these eyes and wisdom and knowledge are just, just surrendered to God. And the elders are to surrender to God. And they're singing these songs of the worthiness of Christ. First, the angels sing this song about his worthiness to take the scroll because he died. And then the elders, and they also the, uh, sing this song, You are worthy, the lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them sang, because he is the, the creator of all creation. Everything created that has been created was created through Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. There's our worship again. That worship of apologetic, of worshiping the slain Lamb who is alive and who has all authority and power as the Lion of the tribe of Judah who is fighting for you and he's fighting for me and he's fighting for those people we're trying to reach out to. He's fighting for this community and he wants us to engage not by our power but by his power. And then we go through chapter six and he opens the first scroll, and he, uh, the, the, the first seal. He's opening this, he's popping the seals, right? And he's, he gets the first one and all this crazy stuff happens. And then he opens the second one and like, thunder and lightning and the earthquakes and the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and he's just opening these scrolls and opening these scrolls chapter seven kind of breaks off and talks about kind of the security of god's people and how god's watching over his people because there's all this tumult and chaos and you're like are, are we going to be okay and chapter seven's like you're going to be okay i've got you and it kind of leaves you hanging there for a minute because you've been through six seals opening and it's been crazy terrible violence and tumult and crazy stuff and then chapter seven you're kind of on pause and it's like it's like if the first six were this bad what's the seventh one going to be like that's the big one and then you get to chapter eight verse one when he opened the seventh seal and you're like uh-oh this is going to be something 
There was silence in heaven for half an hour. That's a, quite the contrast, isn't it? All that noise and rumbling, power and earthquakes, destruction. And had heaven ever been silent? I don't know. Weren't they worshiping day and night? Never stop singing, never stop saying, never stop worshiping, never stop laying the crowns down. But now it's completely silent. Like 30 seconds of silence feels long. Like if we wait right now for even a minute or two, we'd be like, when's he gonna start talking again? You might actually want me to say something because it's awkward, you know? Um, and then he, he's opened that seventh seal. And then it goes into a series of trumpets and things go crazy again. And then we get, I'm gonna just move over to chapter 12. Uh, we're not gonna be here all night, which is reassuring because, you know, it's Revelation. Um, we get to chapter we get like a bunch of chapters of trumpets and the, the message is God is a judging and God is powerful and you better get on his team and, and there's some rough stuff going on out in the world and God's taking care of his business, you know? He's bringing justice. And then in chapter 12, it moves to the woman and the dragon. And this is where it starts getting kind of, kind of mysterious and kind of weird and creepy, but um, I'm gonna try to shed a little bit of light on it because it was... This was incredibly relevant to John and his audience. And I think if we can understand why it was so incredibly relevant to John and his audience, then we'll be able to understand why it's incredibly relevant to us today. That's always the move we're making in the Bible. We look at the Bible. What, what was the message? What was going on? And then we say, okay, now that I understand that, now we go, go over here you know, and say, okay, what does that mean for us? And so Michael the archangel is fighting Satan. Go over here to chapter 12. He's fighting this dragon. And it says in 12, 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Okay. Sounds like Satan and the cosmic battle with Jesus going on here. And then down in 17, it says, then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. There's a cosmic battle going on God is fighting the forces of darkness. This dragon, the devil, and God, and Michael, the archangel, they're having this battle up in the cosmos, but it's also not just, not just transcendently up in the sky. He gets hurled down here, and then all the messy stuff comes down here, and now he's like looking for us, and he's trying to cause trouble. And we know that because we experience it. And it's awful, and it's nasty, and people end up dying, and hard stuff happens. And then we get into 13, and the devil, the devil likes to form a team. And you almost get this unholy trinity of sorts. You got the devil, and you got these two beasts. And I think I know what it's talking about. I think I do. Because the more you get to know their world, the more when you hear it and read it, it it just becomes more clear what's going on. So let me just tell you a little bit about the way their world worked in, in the Roman Empire. So Julius Caesar, um, when he died, a comet flew past. And they said, there he went. He became a god. Now all of a sudden you just divinized the emperor, which is not a new thing. Egypt did that, all those things, right? And so what does that make Caesar's son? Son of God and divine. So if Caesar is divine and his descendants are divine, then you worship Caesar. And that took a little while to develop the worship side. And then you get this guy Nero. And we all know he's really bad, right? The fire of Rome, blaming the Christians, intense persecutions, it was bad. And what they end up doing is they say, we want everybody in all of our cities 
to worship Caesar. So how do you get everybody to worship Caesar? Well, have you ever seen like on, online or a museum like a little bust of like a Caesar, like a little, a little head and little shoulders? They would make those things and they would set them up by the city gates and when you came through the city, they would be like, hey, worship Caesar. You're gonna do business in our town? You better get along with our gods. Because if you don't get along with our gods, it may not go well here. And our city does not want people who are going to upset our gods. And we don't want that kind of people around here. And so they actually call, called Christians atheists because the Christians refused to worship all these different gods. It's kind of weird to us, but that's how they saw it. And so they had a whole emperor cult, an entire system, temples and priests for Caesar. And the emperor cult was out there to influence people and to enforce the worship of Caesar. And when you get to the 666, I'm going to read the chapter with all this in mind. Maybe you can kind of hear some of these things going on with the two beasts. In, in the Greek New Testament, there are, there's a, a variant. There, sometimes, you know, you get a text that has a word in, it, in this manuscript, and maybe it's a little off in this, like a the word's different or a uh, letter's different or the order switched or something. There's nothing like major about that. You can, uh, when you read English and there's a, mis a mistake in English, you typically almost just read right over it. Like you, you know what that's saying when you read it. That's like 99.9% .9 of any variation in the Bible. As an English, re as a Greek reader, you would read right over it and know exactly what that just said. A like misspelled word or something. Like we do that all the time. Because they're hand copied. There's no printing press, right, yet. So... 666 has two um, versions or whatever, like in the manuscripts. One is 616 and one is 666. And Nero Caesar spells his name N-E-R-O or N-E-R-O-N. And N is 50, which is the difference between 616 and 666. So Nero Caesar and Neron Caesar with Gematria, which is like the Roman numerals all have numbers, I is 1, V is 5, X is 10, right? Every letter has a number. And they knew their number. Like, I would know that Matt had a number, and if my 47 came up and during my week or whatever, whatever that is, I would be like, hey, it's my lucky day, or I should do that. Or what, they had this superstition about their number. So this was not an unusual thing. Like, when we were at the 666, and we're like, in their world, it was like, that was just normal, these numbers and letters and stuff, right? So when John says all this, it's not that mysterious to them. It was kind of in their world. It was just this made more sense. And so Caesar's to be worshipped. He's a god. You got all these priests. You got all these temples. You got all this enforcement. So there's two entities going on. You got Caesar himself, and then you got the emperor cult that's supporting getting people to worship Caesar. Okay? So let me just read Romans 13 with that in mind. And see if this doesn't sound maybe a little more clear. He says that the dragon here with the woman stand, stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, and he had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon, devil, gave the beast, Caesar, his power and his throne and great authority. Caesar has a throne and a power and great authority. All that, all that stuff Caesar has. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. There was a, a myth about Nero that was spun up that Nero was going to die and come back to life again. That's part of their history. People were thinking after he died, he's coming back. He didn't. But the whole thing of he looked like he was dead but wasn't dead kind of fits Nero. It's part of the story. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshiped the dragon, the devil, because that he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked who is like the beast and who can make war against him? Caesar. That's Caesar, right? Like who can make war against this guy? And now notice this. It says the beast was given the mouth of an... Uh, the, the beast was given a mouth to utter words and, uh, and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander the name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. 
He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Again, Caesar, Caesar, Caesar. All the inhabitants of the earth with, uh, will worship the beast, all those whose names have not been written in the book of life who belong to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And if anyone goes into captivity, into captivity he will go. And if anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. This had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon, like the devil. He exercised all authority of the first beast. Notice this. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf. Emperor cult. They're working on behalf of Caesar, right? They're trying to get people to worship Caesar. And made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. That's the emperor cult. That's exactly their job. That's their job description. Get people to worship Caesar. And when he had performed great and miraculous signs and even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth uh, in the full view of men, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf, uh, on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth and he ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast. That's what we just talked about. Setting up these images who was wounded by the sword and yet lived, and he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. That's exactly what the emperor cult did. And also forced everyone, small and great, rich or poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand and on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the, uh, or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it's a man's number. And that is 666, which is the number, if you take Nero Caesar, it's 666, or Neron Caesar 616, which is the other one, right? So I, to me, it's extraordinarily clear. He's saying, I'm writing this to let you know, guys, what's going on in your world. But what we see in the news, we see in the tabloids and all this, hey, don't get the microchip, you know, don't get the barcode on there, don't, don't, don't. It's like, and you, maybe, you, I'm not trying to just make light of it, like, you know, people really believe that, and if you believe that, I'm, I'm sorry that I just kind of did it that way. <laughs> it just kind of, there I go again. Uh, it, I just don't think that's what it's talking about. And, and now here's the thing with God. God can recapitulate things throughout history to bring the same kind of thing around and around again. He can do that. So if something like that were to happen again, and you'd be like, yeah, well, this was talked about, I would not be shocked by that. Because God's just that good at it. But what that misses is these are the things which are soon to take place, that he's going to explain to them stuff from their world. So, um, so you have the two beasts, and hopefully that makes it a little bit more clear. Um, and then in 14, we get now three angels, and they weren't warned about worshiping the beast. They warned about the coming judgment of God. God begins in verse 14 of chapter 14 to bring this harvest on the earth. Chapter 15, there are seven plagues. He brings about his judgment. Chapter 17, there's the great prostitute who sits on the beast. This is Rome. She's sitting on seven hills. Rome was built on seven hills. And he's speaking very cryptically here because, you know, it, sometimes that, that anti-imperial rhetoric can get you in trouble. Like, don't use the name of the government, call it Babylon. Don't use the real name because if you, you know, it's like, then you're not gonna know. And then it's like the code word kind of stuff. It's like, but everyone knows exactly what, what he's talking about. Uh, and then in 18, there's this declaration that Babylon has fallen and God has brought judgment. And then chapter 19, there's this great celebration about the fall. And let's see, it says in verse 11 of chapter 19, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. On it, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. Uh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing on the sun, 
who cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of the kings and the generals and the mighty men of the horses and their riders and all the flesh of the people, free and slaves, small and great, all those who are receiving the judgment, who received the mark and bought into the emperor worship and refused to turn to God and, and that, all that. And so then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered there to make war against the rider of the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf, that second beast. And with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. The two of them were thrown into the lake, uh, in the lake of burning sulfur, and the rest of them were killed by the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider and the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. And then you get the thousand years, you get the Satan's doom, ch chapter 20, verse 7, then you get the judgment of the dead in chapter 20, verse 11. And I want to just read just a few verses here, 20 verse 11. He says, Then I saw a great throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. And I'm just fascinated by chapter 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. I always think, well, the devil went in the lake of fire. Death went in the lake of fire. Hades went into the lake of fire. That's because resurrection. He's defeated death. That's 1 Corinthians 15. The last enemy to be defeated is death. And there's no more death. There's no more tears, no more mourning. Everything has been made new, 21, 5. And so God makes a new heavens and a new earth, and he brings us into his eternal glory. And that's chapter 21, when God makes everything new, 21, 5. And then in chapter 22, well, let me, let me read 21, 1 through 5, and we'll, we'll get into 22 and we'll wrap up. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. Remember John 1.14? He made his dwelling among us. The incarnation of Christ. Literally, he pitched his tent. He tabernacled with us. Well, now we tabernacle with God. In Hebrews, it talks about a heavenly tabernacle. A heavenly temple. And I heard the voice saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. Sounds like Eden, doesn't it? And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Amen? Don't you look forward to that? And we'll get to be there. And... When we have an issue with our brother or our sister in Christ, it's like we got to remember, like, we're going to be there together. And we're going to probably look back on those little arguments and go, what were we doing? Wow, isn't God good? He's so good. We're all here. His grace is sufficient. But it's just going to put everything in perspective. I wish we could have that perspective now. I don't know that we really can't do that, can we? We can get an idea of what that might be like, but I don't think we can really understand that. And I think it would put our friends who don't know Christ into perspective. And then we talk about our loved ones, and what if you find out someone's not there, and are you going to be sad about that? And they say, well, there's no more tears, but he also says he'll wipe away every tear. And you maritime people are saying, hey, he said there's no more sea. What about that? Well, <laughs> sorry, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but I do know that, you know, the sea was like the symbol of absolute terror and chaos. You know, on those old maps, it would say there'd be dragons and there'd be the black area on the map where nobody knew what was out there. It was like, you knew that when the men went off in the ship and the ship never came back, mm. oof, they're, they're down there. It's like, you don't want to get lost at sea. You don't want to go down, like, you know, you don't want that to happen. This, the sea was like chaos. Like, think about the flood. 
And so I just wonder if when he says there's no more sea, what he's doing is he's pointing at one of their greatest chaotic fears and saying, all that fearful stuff is gone. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I, just, I won't be surprised if there's a sea, but I also won't be surprised if there's not. He kind, of, kind of said it, but it is revelation, right? So we can hope, because I like the sea. So, um, so anyway, let me, let, me, let me talk a little bit about why we're talking about this, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, this whole thing's going to come to a glorious end and a glorious beginning. And God wants every single person in the entire world to be a part of it. It, it. God would be the most pleased if it came time for all that crazy stuff, and there was no one to do it to, because they all came to him. And in 2 Peter 3, 9, you know, it says that God is patient because he doesn't want anyone to go through all that. He's waiting on people to repent. And maybe the church needs to lead the way on repentance. Maybe the church needs to lead the way on confession. Donald Miller at Blue Like Jazz, you know, he set up a confessional booth, and you're like, well, what's that about? You walk in there, and he confesses his sins to you. And people are like, I don't think Christians acted like that. Kind of different. Does the Bible say confess your sins one to another? That's at the invitation. I don't think that's, I mean, yes. But is it working? Like, does that happen like, like, a lot. Most churches, it doesn't. And so we're going to have to be vulnerable. We're going to have to be sometimes a little uncomfortable and put ourselves there. And that doesn't mean you just spill your guts to everybody and just, you know, run amok or something. But um, there's some hard things to do. But his grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. He's given us the full armor of God. He's indwelled in us his Holy Spirit. And on and on the list can go. He, he's taken care of us. And what's our response? It's called faith. Matthew Bates has come out with some books in the last five, six years that basically the word faith means allegiance. And I think that's right. Because we know faith doesn't just mean belief because he says the devil believes but doesn't have faith and the devil shudders when he believes. So we're not just on the, on, well, do you believe in Jesus, yes or No. It's, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he is Lord, which means master. I believe he's Christ, which means Messiah, which means he's anointed king, which means he has a kingdom, which means I live in the kingdom, which means I surrender to his rule and reign through the power of the Holy Spirit, who's his presence in my life, which makes us a temple of God, which makes us holy. Therefore, we can't, Paul says, because you're a temple, you cannot, cannot act any way you want to act because God is in you. And so don't take all that and just toss it out there into immorality or whatever. It's like, that's a big deal. But the world needs to see the church lead in a Christ-like manner. And when the world sees that, they're going to have a far better chance at that kind of apologetic than like the riled up, angry version. There's a time for that. Jesus, I think, showed us there is a time for that. But you've got to be incredibly selective and incredibly prayerful and, in, and in, incredibly careful about that because we don't want to damage our witness to the world. And it's going to take people a lot for them to come around. And we're going to have to be very patient with them and not take offense that we've delivered this amazing gospel proclamation and they're like, no, I still love you. I'm going to try again later. You know, I've got to keep on praying. Because we don't want anybody to end up like that. And God doesn't want anybody to end up like that. Chapter 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. What do you hear there from two nights ago? Do you hear Genesis? No longer any curse. There's a tree of life. There's a river. No more need for a sun or moon. He created the sun and moon. 
There's like 19 things that are in Genesis 1 and 2 that are in Revelation 21 and 22. It's like almost 20 things. And what God seems to be doing is, I've brought this whole story full circle. And the, the way in which it was in the beginning is the way in which it will be in the end only better. With imperishable bodies, free from sin, free from death, with our loved ones. We sent off our, our brother Ian last Sunday. It was really sad. He got his PhD in history and he's moving to Washington State and we're really sad about it. He's such a friend. And I'm trying to pray for him at the end of worship and I'm like, poof. I made a really short prayer because it was like, oh, I got like three sentences out. I'm like, Jesus' name, amen. And I'm still sad about it. But we're like, you know what? We're going to get so much time together. Hmm, he's so good. And I want my neighbors to be there. Even my rough one, like I talked about a few times. Like, man, how much joy would I have seeing him come down the way? And like, you're here. What happened? Oh, Matt, it was because you were so nice. <laughs> well, actually, Matt, you were a real jerk, but I found another guy who was a Christian, and he, he helped me, finally. I was kind of starting to wonder. Mm. Whew. The healing of the nations. Wow. God wants the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him. We will serve him. Just chase a little rabbit just for a sec. Um, say, like, what are we going to do when we're in heaven? What do they do in Eden? They had a vocation. Say, are we just going to get bored up there and this and this forever? And worship, 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 worship. You know, lots of communion. First Corinthians 11 again. 26. A through, you know, I'm just being silly. But, you know, it's like, but we ask that question. It's a serious question. And I think it's going to be, a, we're going to have a vocation. We're going we're gonna to work and create and, and garden and till and work and build and, like, be proud of stuff and, like, help each other out. And, because that's how it was in the beginning. He gave them a job. The curse made it hard, but he said, now there's no more curse. Maybe you get to do something you really enjoy. So I'm like, well, maybe we need to kind of convert the guy that created Krispy Kreme. You know, it's like, get that recipe over there. I mean, you know, it's like all your favorite things. Go find those people and make sure that, you know, it's like, um, I'm just teasing. We need to find everybody. We need to find the hard people. The people where you're like, oh, they're going to be, the no, that's going to make it awesome when you see them there because it was so hard here. And then you get to get all that good stuff over there forever with the people you had a hard time with. Not just awesome. And so they will see his face. His name will be on, their, on our foreheads. I don't know how that works, but is that symbolic? Is that literal? It's like, I don't, I don't know. There will be no more night. There will not be any need for lamp or light, the light of the sun, for God will be our light. He will give us light, and we will reign for, they will reign forever and ever. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you what? Give you peace. And he will put his name on you. God bless.